uh, from here on, I'm gonna be um, a little bit more detailed, yeah? Just a little bit more detailed. This is a brother by the name of Richard B. Moore. Um, and yeah, he uh, is an activist, born in the late 1800s. Um, and so he, he he's an activist. He becomes um, a member of a number of black nationalist organizations. Um, and um, he is, he also joins the Socialist Workers Party, but is actually kicked out because he's a, he's a bit too black nationalist. He's also a member of the African Blood Brotherhood, which, which is a contemporary organization to that of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, though a black nationalist, Richard B. Moore also is a bit of a critic of Marcus Mazzaia Garvey. Um, and you know what I mean, but you know, somebody who's committed to um, the uplift of, of black people and African people in general. He's also, well, let me come back to what, what, what I was just about to say. All right. Um, this is reading from uh, a paper that he, that he um, delivered, wrote in 1963 called African Consciousness uh, in Harlem. He's, and he's dealing with the history of Africans identifying with an African identity. Yeah. He says, consciousness of their ancestral homeland has thus has been historically evident from the first arrivals when some of these Africans brought as slaves into the Americas, killed themselves, believing that they would thereby return to Africa. The most famous incident of this is, is known um, um, as the Ibo suicide, something or another, but a group of Ibo Africans um, on a ship um, being brought from Africa, um, basically uh, mutinied the on the ship, took over the reins of the ship, um and um you know basically kill off the all of the, 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 the crew um and instead of uh being ens enslaved yeah when they met up on land they all just collectively just walked into the sea and drowned yeah um uh, because they refused uh, to be enslaved and so this is just that's just actually one story one particular incident yeah like this because you know we hear of others you hear of the stories of africans just throwing themselves overboard for example and these kinds of things but going on with this uh, particular article awareness of their heritage um of of culture and dignity continued during the colonial period and the early days of this republic yeah so now we're going into from now the late the the, the, the last quarter year um of the 1700s so we're going from the transition of america being a british colony to it the American Revolution and the organizations now that African people in America began to develop. The name African was then preferred and used instead of the slave master's degrading epithet, Negro, witnessed thus the Free African Society founded in Philadelphia. This is the forerunner of the African Pet Protestant Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, which is in the Caribbean, also the American Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, note also the African Lodge of Prince um, Hall Masons in Boston, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, which is different now from the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, African Society for Mutual Aid, African Grove Playhouse in New York, and many so named throughout the country yeah so what begins to happen is that not just in the united states of america but throughout the americas yeah you begin to see, see the development yeah um of black organizations starting to flourish yeah um uh, at the end of the 1700s i should say in the last quarter of the 1700s so this this is now the first period in which africans are forming official organizations Nations, yeah, in the, uh, the in the Americas as a part during the enslavement experience. Okay, um, and so we're talking about not just the United, what we, what would become the United States of America. We're talking about the the Caribbean as well. Noting that a lot of these churches, especially the Baptist ones, linked up throughout the Caribbean and um, North, um, North America. Yeah, so even as far as Canada, these um, organizations were being developed. The important thing to also note is that these are all developing independent of each other. So they're not related, yeah? Um, the, one, of them, one of them is not necessarily ca ca catching inspiration from the other, except for the fact that there is speculation um, as to the degree to which the writings of Phyllis Wheatley, um, Olauda Equiano, um, Ottawa Coguano, and Ignatius Sancho um, had proliferated um, uh, the Americas in terms of African people during that time. There's speculation. Nobody actually knows the extent of the of of the influence yeah but for, for for you know to all intents and purposes most of this is taking place independently of each other so what's happening is that 
when these Africans are developing organizations of political, economic, and social uplift and spiritual ritualistic experience, noted, noting that all of these things are not necessarily separate and distinct from each other. Yeah, So the church was also advocating on behalf of African people and trying to liberate, abolish slavery, um, working for social, economic, and political uplift. Okay, So then these are not all mutually exclusive um, ideas and um, uh, as far as these organizations are concerned. But the minute, as soon as we start to self-organize, the identity that we adopt and affirm is African. Think about that. Yeah, this is before the American Revolution now. Yeah, so there, there's no um, self-defined, affirmed identity called American as yet. Not to say that there's, there's no white people um, in America affirming Americanness at all. My point is that among Africans, even as white America was self-affirming as American, black people in America and throughout the Americas were self-defining as African. Okay, Richard B. Moore goes on, as early as 1788, an organized body of Afro-Americans, and note the use of this word, this article was written in 1963, yeah, and um, Richard B. Moore is noted as being one of the earliest proponents and advocates of the terminology African-American um, and the rejection of just American or Negro for, for in particular, yeah. And even black, he wasn't even fond of the use of the term black to refer to um, Africans, yeah. So not the use of this term, Afro-Americans, yeah. So this was being used already, okay. Um, in Newport, which included Paul Coffey, who was soon to make history in this respect, wrote to the Free African Society of Philadelphia proposing a plan for, the, for emigration to Africa. What he means by Paul Coffey um, um, making history in this respect, Paul Coffey is noted as one of the first Africans uh, to actually take Africans back to Africa. And um, we should note that thousands, thousands of African men, women, and children made the, the journey back to Africa, repatriated back to Africa um, between the 17 uh, and throughout the 1800s, thousands, and possibly tens of thousands. Okay, right, so moving on now, 1787, yeah, Prince Hall, who is the founder of one of the aforementioned organizations, which is the African uh, Masonic Lodge, yeah, uh, presented um, a petition to the government of Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts, yeah, which is said to have been presented by a number of African Blacks, yeah, of the Masonic Lodge, and it reads thusly, we or our ancestors have been taken from our dear connections and brought from Africa and put into a state of slavery in this country. Let me pause right there. Let me pause right there. Why am I pausing? When he says we or our ancestors, I want to emphasize the fact that when he says we, he means that there are people among this group who were not born in the Americas, but were born on the African continent. There are people among this group who have knowledge to memory of the African continent. Yeah. So I'm emphasizing that because many people believe that this identity of African is exclusively um, the domain of Africans who were ripped from Africa and had no knowledge of it um, and in, in an attempt to define themselves with no knowledge of the continent, yeah, they come up with this African thing. No, this was the definition that was uh, coined, yes, and affirmed by Africans who were born on the continent, yeah? And so if they're affirming this African identity collectively because they understand that they come from different parts of the continent, but they ref they're, they're affirming a collective identity. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna go on, we're gonna come back to that in a second. All right. Um, from which unhappy situation we have been lately in some measure delivered by the new um, constitution which has been adopted by the state or by a free act of our former masters that's what he's referring to there is obviously um the, the the success of the american revolution in 1776 yeah from which unhappy situation yeah we have been lately in some measure he says delivered by the new constitution which has been adopted by the state and what they basically mean is that obviously 
um, uh, the the um, the American Constitution, the American ideal was that all men are supposed to be created equal and free, and land of the free, home of the brave. All of these concepts are, are floating in the air. Some Africans were promised um, to be uh, liberated, free, made free, if they fought on behalf of both sides of the, the, the fight. To be honest with you, um, the British um, side and the and the American Revolutionist or Republican side. Um, and to some degree, some of that did take place. Some, 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 some were able to quote unquote buy their freedom and whatever else like that. Yeah, that's what he means um, by this. Okay, um, yeah. So, or, or by a free act of our former masters, but we yet to find ourselves um, in many respects in very disagreeable and disadvantageous circumstances. Most of us which must attend, most of which, sorry, must attend us. So long as we and that should be our children live in America. So basically what he's saying is, all right, there's, there's some more that come of, you know, freedom of one, you know, as post 1776 than there was uh, pre-1776. But still, we're in disagreeable and disadvantageous circumstances. Yeah, he go, they go on. This and other considerations, which we need not here particularly mention, induce us earnestly to desire to return to Africa, our native country, which warm climate is much more natural and agreeable to us, for which the God of nature has formed us, and where we shall live among our equals and be more comfortable and happy that we can be in a, that sorry that we can be in our presence than we should say we can be in our present situation and at the same time may have the prospect of usefulness to our brethren there right again i want you to note one the affirmation of african identity the tie the collective tie to a group of ancestors yes and the unified commonality that is being shared in terms of common experience yeah common history and common destiny that is being affirmed by this particular um petition okay also note that in the affirmation of african identity this is actual activism that is going on so the two examples that we have so far when africans are affirming african identity they're not just doing it just to feel good they're not just doing it because it makes them feel nice and to hold on to an illusionary utopian ideal of what Africa means and represents. This is them affirming their an African identity for the purpose of enacting uh, what they consider to be a liberation or freedom agenda on behalf of black people. Let's move on. Um, this leads us humbly to propose the following plan to the consideration of this honorable court. The soil of the, of the native country, Africa, is good and produces the necessities of the life of life in great abundance there are there are large tracts of uncultivated lands which if proper application were made of them it is presumed might be obtained and would be freely given for those to settle upon who shall be disposed to return to them when this shall be affected by a number of blacks sent there for this purpose who shall be thought most capable of making such applications and transaction, sorry, transacting business, then they who are disposed to go and settle there shall form themselves into a civil society united uh, by, a by a political constitution in which they shall agree. So what they're proposing is that they have organized a group of people that are willing to go to Africa and uh you know basically check out the terrain see what opportunities are over there um for the, the africans in america yeah come back make whatever arrangement needs to be made over there come back get the rest of us um so that we can go yeah but they're, they're affirming this because they want basically self-reliance in this process okay they want to add an act self-reliance in the process they're saying we're going to control the process by which we move from yasa to Dessa. Yeah, all right. But these must be furnished with necessary provisions for the voyage and with farming utensils necessary to cultivate the land and with the materials which cannot, cannot at present be obtained there and which will be needed to build houses and mills. 
what you just read or what i have just read there is defined as reparations that is part of a reparations claim we're gonna move you have disenfranchised us in america you, you must therefore enable us yeah with the provisions that we need to travel over there even as we control the process via which we go over there return to africa that is okay now we're going to move on to martin delaney all right martin